OK, so I have been proceeding all along uh, under a very strong assumption, which is that the variables that we're talking about and the variables that we're including uh, are either measured or latent. And when they're measured variables, uh, they're measuring what we think they're measuring without error, right? which is uh, a highly dubious assumption in real science. So I just want to go over for a few minutes um, why that's a problematic assumption and then just hint at what you might do about it, even though I'm, I won't have time to really cover this in any depth. But I just want to make sure you're aware of what's out there. OK. So there's two problems I want to sort of bring to your attention. One is measurement error, and the other is what I call coarsening. right? And they end up having the same effect. So if I have that model in which z is a common cause of x and y, right? Uh, you all know now that x and y are de-separated by z. It's a non-collider. And so if we could measure all those variables and look at our uh, test for independence, and the test came out appropriately, we should find that x and y are independent uh, once we control for or condition on z. Okay? So that's the fundamental connection that we've been relying on to do all this, all this work. Uh, but what if it turns out that we don't have any way to measure z directly, what we can do is measure z with something called z prime, but there's also random noise in z prime. So z prime is in fact equal to the real guy z plus right, this thing epsilon prime, which is just measurement error, just random white noise. Right? Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. It's got a normal distribution because it's really an aggregate of 15 billion other things but it's just white noise. Well, the problem is that theoretically, x and y, right, although they were deseparated by z, they are not deseparated by z prime. So if I have a measure with error, right, at the theoretical level, I lose conditional independence. And this is a huge problem, as you can imagine. Uh, unless the variance of epsilon prime is 0, so that if there's a constant that's being added to z prime, Right? That's not a problem. But if it's actually putting noise in that has variation, then as the sample grows without bound, right, you will more and more be able to reject uh, the independence of x and y when you condition on z prime. Now, that's not the only problem. There's another one that's a different one that's called, I think, coarsening. So in, in that case, um, z might be some continuous quantity. right? Um, but instead of measuring the continuous quantity, you measure something discrete like low, medium, and high, right? or 0, 1, or whatever it is you measure. So you might do something like, right, when z is in between negative infinity and 0, right, you assign z star 0. And when z is in between 0 and some cutoff i, you assign it to 1. And if it's in between i and j, you assign z prime to 2, etc. So you have k plus 1 different categories in your now discretized, right, coarsened measure z prime, z star. Now, there's a difference here, right? z prime is really measuring this with error. z star is not measuring z with error. I'm assuming it's a perfect measure, but it's projecting z onto a coarse scale that has fewer categories than the underlying guy z. And the sad fact is that almost always, unless I'm incredibly lucky, right, that when I condition on z star, right, x and y are still going to look dependent. So in both cases, right, when I measure something with error and I measure something by coarsening it, I lose conditional independence, which is the cornerstone of all this work. Right? Now, there's an asymmetry here, which I'm not going to go into, but which is nice, which is that when I actually do these things, I lose conditional independence, but it's extremely hard, if ever even possible, to produce conditional independence when there was none to start with. So in both of these cases, here was the conditional independence, right? I measure with error and I coarsened, and I lose conditional independence. But I can't find a case that's 
easy to, 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 to put together, in which I started right, with this, but I got to conditional independence by having error in measurement or coarsening. So it's a one-way one thing. You lose conditional dependence by measuring with error. You don't gain it back. And when, when you lose conditional dependence, typically what you can infer is less right, than what you could before. So your ability to infer what's causing what goes down. right? Your information goes down, but you don't get misled in a certain way. So there's a good piece of news and a bad piece of news. OK, so what could I do about this that might have any right, you know, positive influence uh, uh, on, on this problem? Well, um, there's a lot of ways you can go about it if you have a single variable that's measured with error. Right? One of the strategies that's done typically is called sensitivity analysis, in which case I, I parameterize how much of this guy's variation comes from the real measure and how much comes from random noise. Right? It's just the ratio right, of the, the variances of these two. So if this has a very high variance compared to this, right, then there's very low measurement error. And if this has a lot of variation compared to this, then there's very high measurement error. So what I can do in the sensitivity analysis is I can say, well, let's consider 10 different levels of measurement error, because right? I don't know how much there is. And then for each value of the measurement error, fix it, and that will tell me right, something about the x and y relationship fixing that level of measurement error. And then if I do that for lots of different measurement error level errors, then I can get some idea of how sensitive my overall conclusions are to this level of measurement error. And so it might be the case that, well, all the conclusions I want right, are pretty clear right, for the first six levels of measurement error. But once I go back by the sixth and I'm into the seventh and eighth, right, then I get problems. So that means theoretically, as a scientist, you can say, OK, as long as I can assume right, that my measurement error is bounded below this particular level, I'm OK with what I want to actually conclude. So that's what a sensitivity analysis does, roughly. Uh, a better way to go is to do a full Bayesian analysis and put some probability right, over the amount of measurement error right, and then derive a posterior right, for whatever conclusion you're looking at based on that prior. Right? So I showed you the lead and IQ case. So I did that in the lead and IQ case because all the variables we, we looked at before were actually measuring, we thought, with error, like how much lead the kid was exposed to. Like we have the baby teeth, but that's a lot of error in terms of what the cumulative right, exposure they had as a kid and so forth. And so I went to visit Herb Nealman, and I elicited from him like, how much measurement error he thought was really going on in his data. And I got a prior, and I put that over the me measurement errors, and then I induced a posterior, and I got something similar to what you saw. And you can also put bounds, right? So if you can just uh, uh, put bounds on the measurement error, sometimes that's enough right, to bound the effect that you care about, and then you can, you can, you can do what you need. OK, so all those are feasible strategies. Um, and another strategy to get around the whole thing completely is to have multiple measures, right, in which case those two measures have independent noise. So if I have right, two measures of z, z1 and z2, right, both of which right, have noise, but those noise are independent of each other. So the noise that affects z1 and the noise that affects z2 are independent of each other then I actually can do what I want, right? <clears throat> which I'll get to in a second. What's typically done um, is that we have multiple measures of a thing, and then we add them up right, in some weighted sum and just put them into a single number that we call a scale. Right? This is the typical thing done in social psychology and in other social sciences. Um, we measure multiple things. We put them together in a scale. And then we treat this variable z scale as a proxy for this thing z. We just say, that is z. And then the question is, does z scale screen off x and y? Does it deseparate x and y? And what do you think the answer is? The answer is no. So again, this is a tradition that's incredibly ubiquitous in statistics and social science, and it doesn't work, and I don't understand why it's done. So it turns out that they're not independent on z scale, and, and that's a real pity. Okay. So let me just show you, just with a quick example, 
right, how things come out, right? So if I take this lead and IQ case again and I assume unrealistically that in truth, lead and IQ are completely independent once I condition on the parental resources because clearly uh, uh, families with a lot of parental resources will minimize the lead exposure to their kids and will also maximize the cognitive stimulation to their children. So um, the negative effect on lead and the positive effect on IQ are plausible. What's not plausible is that there is no edge from this to this. But if this was the truth, then you'd want to be able to discover it. And the way you discover that is to say that, gee, parental resources makes these guys independent of each other. Well, parental resources is a classic variable that's very difficult to measure and define, right? What is it? I mean, how do you measure that? How do you go to a family and say, your parental resources are 16, and this family's parental resources are 15.2, right? What does that even mean? So that's extremely complicated and hard to do, right? <clears throat> um, but we, we, we can easily demonstrate with simulating data that if I do regress, right, um, IQ on lead and PR, and when I look at the coefficients, right, uh, that the parental resources will be significant, but the lead will be screened off, and so the p-value will be insignificant, which shows that now lead is detectably screened off from IQ. So that would be a regression that told us, yep, lead has no effect. And I'm assuming now that I can measure parental resources perfectly. Okay? So that's the base case. But let's say I can't measure it at all, and I have three things that measure it, x1, x2, and x3, right? And what I do is, right, I put together a scale called PR scale, parental resource scale, which is just the sum of 1, 2, and 3 divided by 3. And dividing by 3 makes no difference whatsoever. So I just sum these guys up, and I treat that number, PR scale, as a proxy for parental resources. Well, then I do the same regression, right, and what I get is what you'd expect, like lead is no longer screened off, in fact, it comes out highly significant. So it does not work to put together a scale for multiple indicators to screen off lead from IQ. Failed, that's a failed strategy, and it's nothing to do with sample size, it's just a failed strategy. Okay, so what can I do instead? Well, right, I can try regressing on each of those guys individually, right, no difference whatsoever. So I can put the x1, x2, and x3 in individually as opposed to adding them up, doesn't really do anything. What does perhaps do something is to actually treat the variable z, right, in, in the case that what, right, we're looking at, just like the IQ and lead case, as a latent variable model, uh, as a latent variable and model it as a latent variable, right, with a structural equation model. So in this case, right, we're testing to see whether x has any direct effects on y, and we're not able to measure z, but we're modeling it with this model. And we can do, in structural equation models, we can estimate the parameters of this model, it's identified, right, and, and then we can use the parameter estimates, if we're smart, to test for the independence we want. So in this case, the parameter beta xy, which is the size of this edge, right, is going to be expected to be zero just in case x and y are independent on z. So this does work. This is a strategy that will work, even if z is unmeasured and I have imperfect measures of it. So the only guys that are measured are x, y, z1, and z2. z is unmeasured. And I know that z1 and z2 both are measured with error. All right? So I can't add z1 and z2 up and treat them like that z. I can't put them into the regression individually. But if I treat this as, an as a model that has a latent variable and do the parameter estimation, this parameter right, will have an expectation of 0 if and only if x and y are actually independent conditional on z. Okay, so that works. Everybody good? It's a lot to, yeah. In, in, first, uh, you know, in a scale, instead of using a unweighted average, if you use a weighted average that weight has been defined by a you know, factor analysis or principal component analysis, what happens? Same thing. Doesn't work. Is it a latent variable? 
I urge you to go ahead and try it, right? It doesn't work. Okay, so how, how does that work, right? Um, I did the same thing for this case, right? Um, we, we generated data from this model, and I estimated this model, right? And I estimated the coefficient beta, and on the same data, beta turns out to be right, uh, insignificant and small. And so from that fact, I'm going to conclude that lead and IQ are screened off by parental resources, even though I didn't measure it directly. So this strategy really can work. So, so, so what does it depend on? I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now I want to go into what happens when I coarsen. Right? So here's a case where I might have something that I imagine to be continuous parental resources. Right, that I can define on some continuous scale. But I don't do that. I measure it on a binary, in which case I go into every household and I say, oh, you're either bad in parental resources or you're good. Or you're low or you're high. Or you're yes and no. Whatever it is. Binary variable. So I've coded as a 0, 1. So obviously I've projected a continuous thing onto a discrete with two values. And then I put that into the same regression, right, and I have the same problem, right? Lead right, still looks to be significantly associated with IQ even when I statistically control for this binary variable. So it doesn't help to, uh, to, to condition, right, on a variable that's a binary or a discrete projection of a continuous guy either. Okay, so that's sa same slide. And so this, this actually happens all the time uh, in real science, and here's just an example. Uh, that I was a part of by being on a National Academy committee looking at whether TV actually affects childhood obesity. So there were several studies that said, appropriately enough, um, we imagine there's only two mechanisms by which TV could make children obese, right? One mechanism is it inhibits their exercise. Exercise we know, right, right can lead to uh, less obesity. And the other mechanism, it might change their diet by making them eat more. And then more calories consumed also causes obesity. So I think there were a lot of scientists in the room, and in the field, that were willing to say, these are the only two mechanisms that there could be. Um, I think we've learned more since then, but leave that aside, right? If those are the only two mechanisms that we imagine exist, then we could estimate the size or the strength of each mechanism if we could measure these things appropriately. And if we wanted to see the effect of TV on obesity through exercise, then we have to look at the association of TV and obesity controlling for or conditioning on diet. So we block that path. We inactivate that path by controlling for it. And then what we're left with is this path. And so that will tell us the size of the causal influence of TV on obesity through exercise. Uh, just as an as aside, it, it, it's quite interesting that we think pretty clearly now we know that TV has no effect on exercise, which is weird, right? right? Everybody thinks that TV should inhibit exercise. It turns out it looks like it has no effect, and that's been confirmed in several studies in which there's been interventions on TV, accelerometers put on uh, 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 kids' arms, right? All sorts of tests of physical fitness in other ways shows that it just doesn't seem to have any effect. Kids replace... Um, um, uh, different things with TV, uh, like reading, right, or something else, but they don't seem to replace exercise with TV. That might not be true for adults, but for kids it seems to be that way. Definitely has an effect on diet, and it's not a good one. Okay, so here's a real study, 2003, and their goal was to estimate the influence and tease apart the different mechanisms, and what they did was just astonishing, right? They measured exercise on some continuous scale, right, minutes per week or whatever it was. They measured diet on some calorie scale, which is reasonably continuous. And then instead of using those, right, in the statistical model, they estimated they coarsened both of them. So in exercise, they turned it into tertiles, low, medium, high, and they collapsed the two high ones into the high, and they ended up with a binary, right, which is a pr pretty much the worst thing you can do. And then they actually did the same thing for diet. And then what they found, unsurprisingly, right, was that TV and obesity are not screened off even when you control for both exercise and diet after they've been coarsened, right? So they negated their own sort of theory. And they don't know the bias in that mechanism estimation. 
So not good to coarsen, right? Any variable that you think might separate or mediate, right, uh, other two variables, you do not want to measure that badly and you don't want to coarsen it. Now, measuring this <laughs> badly doesn't have that effect. You can still estimate the effects on it consistently, but your standard errors go up. So you lose statistical power, but you do not induce bias. If you measure this badly, right, you turn out to um, have bias in your estimate, but it's always attenuated towards zero. So if the effect is negative, right, it goes up towards zero, and if the effect is positive, it goes down towards zero. So it's a strictly attenuated estimate. So in some sense, you're underestimating the size of the effect when you measure the cause badly. You don't have any problems with the effect, but your statistics are worse. But your real problems come right, in the guys that are in the middle that either could confound or mediate that relationship. So those are the ones that you have to worry about. OK. So I told you that. And here's the problem when you take the strategy of, in a latent variable model, right, really just um, using that latent variable uh, and measuring it in the way you think. So suppose that you specify this model and estimate the parameter beta x, y in order to test to see if x and y are separated by, by z. Uh, but it turns out that they are separated by z in the true model, but there's a couple things you've, <coughs> God bless you, there's a couple things you've left out. So it turns out that z1 is not only measuring z, but it's also measuring x, and it's also measuring y. So z1 is sort of directly responding right, to all three of your variables. Well, it turns out that in that case, the expectation of beta xy will not be zero, just in case the independence holds. And you'll get a bias estimate of this guy because of these two edges that you failed to model when you specified the model to be tested. Right? So that's a very general problem. And so this strategy of using this latent variable model depends upon specifying the model correctly up to a certain kind of correctness. Right? So that's, that's the problem with this strategy in general. And OK. So now let's jump to what psychometricians often do, which is not just measure two guys to respond to a latent, but they measure dozens sometimes. And this is a good strategy because it turns out that you can show that the more indicators you have of a latent variable, right, even if each indicator is weakly associated, weakly responding to the latent, if you have enough indicators, right, then you, you can get a really good measure of that latent variable nevertheless. So more indicators can sometimes really help. Problem is, the more indicators there are, the more susceptible you are to these kind of problems where you have an indicator that's not just measuring one latent guy, it's measuring two. Or it might interact with each other right, in a certain way. But in general, the idea of the task in many contexts is to figure out the causal relationships among unmeasured guys, latent guys. Right? So F1 and F2 and F3 are these constructs we, you know, we, we develop, things like how anxious you are, right? how, um, how depressed you are, how impulsive you are right? in, in educational contexts, what your abilities look like, what math ability you have, what reading ability you have, right? other abilities. All those are taken to be latent, so we can measure if we construct the right indicators, either as questions right? or as items on a test that you know, do something to make you uh, uh, see if you can actually perform some operation. Okay, so we can separate the latent variable models of this type, right, where all the boxed variables are, are items that we measure and the circled guys are the latents that we want to look at and we care about into two components. The model separates into what we call the structural model, right, which is just the relationships among the latents and the latents, and the measurement model, which is just the relationship between the measured and the latent guys. So there's the measurement model for this, and there's the structural model. So what we'd like to be able to see to get some access to that structural model right, is to conclude that F1 is independent of F3 given F2. Right? F2 separates F1 and X3. And the problem is going to come in, if we don't have the right measurement model, we can't find that out. But if we do have the right measurement model, we can find that out. Okay. So 
Here's an example of a psychometric model that I'll, I think I'll go back to and say more about in a few minutes, right? So there was this question of uh, when somebody experiences a lot of stress, how do they cope with it? And one of the hypotheses dealt with, do they cope with it by praying or being religious? Um, and what does stress have to do with depression? Well, the idea was that stress, stress is a cause of depression. And might there be a way to help yourself by uh, uh, dealing with things um, via praying? So lots of measures of stress, lots of measures of depression, and lots of measures, 20 measures of whether or not you're a person who copes with stress religiously. This is a study done at Pitt a long time ago. Here's an example of a psychometric model in education where I have fractions, algebra, trigonometry, negative numbers, and they're all measured right, by a variety of tasks that you had to do mathematically. Okay, okay so the problem and the issue comes out as right, what we want is this property we call local independence so that any relationship between right, the things we measure, these guys, is all mediated by the latents. And, Right, so x1 and x2, if they're going to be associated, it's because of f1, right, and only f1. And x4 and y1, right, we hope to be associated only through f1 or f2. But you can see that because y1 is a direct cause of x4, that that association is going to be partly from that direct relationship and not only from the latent variables that y4, y1 and x4 measure. So the guys in red are said to be impurities in the model, right? They violate, they cause violations of local independence. Or local independence is, right, every pair of indicators is made independent, right, by the latent variables uh, that they actually measure. Okay, so X4, right, is said to be an impure indicator because it's connected to other indicators via other things and just its latent. And Z2, right, and Y3 are also impurities. Uh, but the strategy we might take in this kind of a case, if we have an impure measurement model, is to eliminate the impure indicators, right? So um, before I get to that, let me describe the kinds of impurity. So this model here on the bottom is said to be first order impure, right? And this model on the bottom is said to be second order impure. So that refers to the number of latent variables I have to condition on to achieve local independence. So in the top, right, I only have to condition on a single latent. And on the bottom, I have to condition on this general factor plus these group factors. So I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but this model, right, uh, is said to have unidimensional measurement models. So there's a group of indicators that unidimensionally measure F1. F2 and F3, and this model is said to be a bifactor model, in which case all these indicators are taken to measure G, which is the thing we really care about. But there's also other group factors that are sources of covariance of subsets of each of the groups. Right? So a classic example is um, we try to figure out how strongly people respond to the world in terms of feeling disgusted. Right? So some people get disgusted easily. Some people do not get disgusted easily. Now, it turns out that you can ask lots of questions to people about whether they get disgusted easily or not, but it turns out there's some things that disgust people uh, very, very specifically and some things that don't, right? So, for example, blood, right? Blood is something that actually some people react very, very badly to, other people don't react to it at all. So this might be your reaction to blood, right? This might be your reaction to, like, spiders and snakes and things like that weird animals. Right? And so the, the way you respond to these questions might not only measure how your general disposition to be disgusted looks, but also in these particular questions, right, your disposition to react to blood and gore. So they're different. So this is the appropriate model for that. Okay. Well, it turns out that there are constraints that we can look at just in the data that will tell us, right, whether these models are pure in the right way and how to do uh, 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 search or change these models, in fact, depending on how these constraints go. So that's the basic factor analysis model where we have four measures, W, X, Y, Z of L, and the loadings are gamma 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so this is the equations for each of the indicators, and it just follows 
that no matter how we parameterize this model, no matter what levels, what values we put in for the gamma and everything else, if things are linear like this, uh, then it turns out that right, the covariance of uh, these variables, right, when we permute it in these different ways, right, necessarily equal each other. So this is called a tetrad equation. Right? That's the underlying reason that the program was named tetrad. We all started with this constraint. Right, so that's a tetrad constraint. And this model implies all three of these constraints, and they'll hold no matter what numbers we put in for those parameters. You cannot avoid, just like deseparation gives you independence, latent variable measurement model structure gets you tetrad constraints. So that's the, the sort of the empirical hook we use to try to get at latent structure. And the first guy to do it was Charles Spearman in 1904. This is a really old project, right? And he um, infamously, not famously, but infamously argued, right, that there was a single underlying trait that some people had to various levels called G, which was general intelligence, right? We now believe that's to be totally false. But he argued for it by showing that if you have two mathematical tests and two reading tests and you look at the correlations between them, Right? and these tetrad constraints held, that that was evidence that there was a single common cause somewhere in your head we couldn't observe called general intelligence. Right? So it turns out that um, for many reasons his reasoning uh, was, was flawed, but not going into that. The general principle or the general idea of connecting rank constraints of tetrads to latent variables was a really great idea. So it's kind of sad that he had to be the standard bearer for this field because he had this uh, bizarre sort of theory he wanted to push as a result of it, but the idea methodologically was very sound and very interesting. What tetrads allow you to do is selectively figure out where the impurities are in a model, and so if the, the truth uh, is on the left, all three of the tetrads below it will hold, and if the truth is on the right, right the first and third will not. So that gives us some reason or some evidence we might be able to localize where the impurities are, right? And it turns out they're all in 2.4 because that's where the F5 is a common cause of. And I'm not going to go into it, but we can take this strategy, right, of lots of tetrads and do this complicated search, right, that uses these rank constraints and find subsets, right, that form nth order pure clusters, right? That's a whole topic I don't have time to go into, but it's a really interesting one. And then we can search for the structural model once we have a detectably pure measurement model. Okay, so we specify, right, uh, the other strategy we could take is if we knew the impurities, we knew exactly how to model them, we could specify the measurement model and then search for the structural model by using uh, that measurement model to test independence relations among the latents. Okay, so I know this is fast, but I, I want to get to um, the examples so that we don't, we don't lose track of what the purpose here is. Okay, so one strategy that we developed and we tried to success was what we call purify. So if this is right, an impure model, right, and you had some idea that this was the impure model, well, if you took away variables, if you said, get rid of x4, or throw it out of my data, and if I threw out z2 from my data, then this is the set of variables I'm left with down here in the bottom, and the model underlying them is a pure measurement model. So if I could tell which indicators are impure and throw them out, then I could get to a pure model. And that's a strategy we've done to success, and there's a couple ways we can do it. But we can even do better than that. We can search from a set of indicators, right, for all the possible measurement models, including the ones that are um, using small subsets of the initial set of variables that are impure, uh, in at least two ways. There, there's two algorithms that look for one-factor models that are first-order pure, and that's called build pure clusters and find one-factor clusters, right? They're different versions of the same basic input-output relations. The FLFC is much faster. And the inputs are covariance matrix of measured items, and the background knowledge that each of these items is going to measure a certain latent variable, and the output is a subset of the items that are clustered in a way we think is detectably first-order pure. And the FTFC is the same thing, but the output is a subset of the items and clusters that are second order pure. All right, so let me go back and then show you the application of this first order 
fine clusters or, be, or build pure clusters to that depression, stress, and religion case. So there were 127 students that were given a 61-item survey where we theoretically believe that the first 21, ST1 to 21, were measuring your stress, and the first, and the, the D1 through D20 were measuring your level of depression, and then the C1 through C20 religious measured to what degree you coped with stress religiously. So that was the initially specified model, and when you estimate the parameters of that model, right, you found that coping, right, religiously was associated with stress, right, and that the relationship between coping and depression, once you controlled for stress, was negative, so coping with things religiously seemed to actually help reduce depression. The, unfortunately, the probability of the chi-square, the p-value of this model was zero, so this model doesn't fit the data at all. So those conclusions are a little suspect. So we applied build pure clusters, and what we found was that we could detect there were five measures of stress that looked to be detectably pure, four measures of coping, and three measures of depression. So we started out with 61, right, and now we're down to 12. So we've thrown out a lot of indicators. So there's a good and there's a bad about that, and I wouldn't say that this is something that I would be completely confident of or rely on, but it's an interesting result because the machine and the algorithm, right, did not find sets of items that were in our pre-theoretical idea across different clusters. So it really did cluster all the stress together, all the coping indicators together, and all the dependent depression indicators together with no prior knowledge guiding that choice. That was just statistical choice. Using this measurement model, right, and assuming that stress was the cause of depression and not vice versa in background knowledge, right, we found that stress and coping were independent given depression, and so the plausible model that comes out of that is the other way. So stress does have an influence on depression, we're assuming it, but then since the depression screens off these two, we orient this as an away from collider, and that it's depression that's causing people to cope with things religiously, not stress, and it's not going the way we hoped. I don't know if this is true, nobody knows if this is true, but it's an interesting difference, right, in what we can conclude, right, once we've start, taken the step of, right, screening the indicators for pure ones. And the nice thing is this model fits the data, right, the p-value is 0.28, and that's unusual for structural equation models. They almost never fit the data. All right, so there's a second order pure one, and we have such models, and we apply right, the FTFC algorithm, then what we'll come out with is second order pure clusters. So in this case, we might come out with 1 through 6 and 8 through 12. Throwing away 7, right, gets us to a clustering that's second order pure. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about latent variable model search. I realize that's very sketchy and very fast. Apologies, but I think it gives you some sense of the idea of that and that thread of the project. All right, let me just summarize search, then I'll open it up to questions, and then we can go to lunch. And then we can go back into our uh, groups this afternoon for breakout. But before the breakout, please come here, and then Joe will explain to you, as Jeremy will, how to use the command line versions of the uh, uh, CCD and how to do the repository uh, checkout and modification with Tetrad. Okay, so here's a summary of what we can do right, about searching, right, um, when, we're, when we're in a situation in which we can't do any experiments and we can passively observe only, right? So we have lots of searches for patterns, right? P, C, and F, G, S are sort of the paradigmatic ones, and we're searching for a Markov equivalence class with no latent confounding, right? We have FCI and many, many variants for searching for PAGs, and that's a Markov equivalence class uh, that includes confounders and selection bias. We have this thing called CCD, which I did not go into at all, but that allows you to search for cyclic models that involve feedback cycles, right? And one has to assume no confounding. Uh, there's this program uh, uh, that's come out of Europe that we have implemented called LINGAM, which is linear non-Gaussian uh, additive models. And we can, f we can find that if the assumptions of that are satisfied, that we can find the unique model that caused the data. Right, so that's the most powerful search we have. 
in a certain sense. And then we can use BPC and FOFC and FTFC, like I just showed you, to look for equivalence classes of linear latent variable measurement models. And then there's a version of LINGAM that involves latent variables, right? I, I can allow confounders, but they have to have measurement models of the sort I showed you. There's a version of LINGAM that's cyclic. You can look for a directed graph, not just directed acyclic graphs. There is a, a search technique that looks at nonlinear additive noise models. And most of these algorithms are pointwise consistent, which is a guarantee of reliability in the sample limit. Right? They're almost all non, they're not uniformly consistent. Right? Uh, if you want to have a uniformly consistent algorithm, you need stronger assumptions. So there's a large uh, group of research, uh, I shouldn't say large, there's a group of research, uh, researchers looking at the problem of what kind of assumptions can we do, can we make, that will get us into uniform consistent land so that we can get error bars around causal inference, which is really a very important thing. We want error bars. Okay, so when we have manipulations, interventions, right, we get a lot more power. And as you could see from the charity case, when I had one of the variables as the experimental intervention, and I entered that in background knowledge, I got a lot of leverage out of that, right? We know a lot about lots of different kinds of interventions and how they play in these searches. So we studied hard interventions, right, where we actually um, look at an intervention which sets a particular variable at a one particular value. That's called the do x. That's kind of uh, a paradigm in Perl. We've also studied hard interventions in which we randomize some variable. So we replace the distribution of x with its parents with a manipulated distribution. We know a, uh, a lot about what soft interventions can buy us. And we've also studied simultaneous interventions. So if we have thousands and thousands of genes, right, and it's not practical to do thousands and thousands of experiments, we can reduce the number of experiments we need to do right, exponentially if we can do simultaneous knockouts, right, of many genes at the same time, right, and not kill the organism, which is a constraint. Uh, so we have sequential interventions, which is um, a really interesting topic. So I intervene on something like a drug I'm going to give you, right, and then I see how you respond, and then I give you a second intervention, an adjustment to the drug, depending on how you responded. That's very complicated to model, but we know how to do it. Uh, there's no search I know of over that, but there's a really good way to model it. And we have sequential conditional interventions, just like, and we have time-sensitive interventions as well. So there's a lot we've learned about interventions um, and a lot for how to combine um, searches that actually use interventions and ones that don't uh, together on the same page. And that's all I have. Uh, I'm sorry if that overwhelmed, uh, but I thought I'd try to get all that stuff out there. I'm happy to answer questions. We can provide you with references. So if you have questions about any of these particular topics, Send us email and we can point you to the literature. And if you have uh, any questions um, uh, of me for now, go ahead. For slide 57, when you're talking about the uh, CIPIC models and not having confounding, do you mean that there can't be confounding in the structure or that there can't be any unmeasured confounders? It's unmeasured. So you have a set of variables and you want to search for a model among them. That set of variables has to be co common cause complete. So if there's a pair of variables that have a common cause, it's also in that measure, in that set of variables. Yeah? Two questions. The first, is there any search method for the latent growth model? Or for the latent what? Latent growth model. There you have the longitudinal data, very similar, very, very a small scale of the time series. Yeah, there, we have latent variable model searches where, where we have time among the latent variables. You were talking about this structural equation model of the stress and coping and depression. Have you ever checked reversely that if, I, if you start from a factor analysis, select the factors, the, the question that are coming with the two different, three different factors, and then put the factor in the model, how it works? Yeah, we've looked at that a lot, and it turns out to be, in the way we've implemented it, a terrible and disastrous strategy. It, it's weird how bad it is. Like just applying factor analysis and trying to get at the latent variables. Is not superior to this structure. Oh no no, it's radically inferior. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I can point you to a paper on that. Clark Lee Moore looked at that. I mean, that was really strange how bad it, it, it turned out to be. Yes.
Why don't I bring it up? Okay, so it is H T T P colon is it wait is it that slash or the other? It's this slash, right? Yeah. And what is it? Bit dot L Y. Bit dot L Y slash I missed the L. L Y slash one Z yeah, somebody read to me. One Capital Z, capital L L. Big W. Uh, Wait, lowercase v. Lowercase w. And then an uppercase w. That's it? Yeah. Do I have to sign in? Okay, and there it is. Okay, great. So I have a course page, data sets, breakout data sets, my slides. Oh, this is great. Download Tetrad, report bugs, datathon page, Java memory, speakers, other resources. Wow. Places to get good coffee. This is amazingly complete. <laughs> Bibliography. Okay, let's give Lizzie a hand. Yeah, this is great. Thank you, Lizzie. This is wonderful. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Someone mentioned earlier the idea of not doing a full-fledged time series, but having multiple time measures, maybe like three or so, right? Yeah. Uh, could someone provide on maybe hack hats and references to how that would be implemented? Sure. Sure, time series. Uh, it's, it's too bad I didn't really have time to do time. But it's very cool in how you can leverage some knowledge of time. There is an interesting set of issues around um, when you have a time series, right, and there's a certain sort of time scale at which things update, but you're measuring, right, at a much slower time rate. Right, so if the thing, like, really goes quickly, but you only measure every, I mean, let's say it takes seconds for everything to change and cycle back but you only measure every few hours, right? What you can learn is very, very different than what you could learn if you measure every couple seconds. So the measurement scale, the frequency of measurement is very important. Right, like the data that I'm thinking of offhand, we have uh, data points that we uh, assume are predictors that are measured on sort of like a daily scale, more or less, right. and then an outcome is temporary later than Right. So that's, that's a whole interesting topic in and of itself. Okay, so let's come back here. For, oh, oh, why don't we say this? For those of you who want to see the command line from Jeremy and the repository from, from Joe, come a few minutes early. Let's say 1.25. Let's get started on time. And those of you who don't want to see that but just want to come to the breakout groups, come 15 minutes after that at 1.40. Okay? Have a great lunch. Thank you.